And there's a particular regarding to expansionary physical policy, but they get the same for the expand, uh, contraction of physical policy. They are critiques. So their critiques are the following. Number one, government spending crowd out private spending. Number two, government borrowing crowd out private investment spending. And then number three, government budget deficit reduce private spending. Okay. Make sure you understand what each of them means. But as a matter of fact, those are not necessarily always true. So the first two is kind of for the same, same illusion or the same mistake. In a sense, between government and you or us, it's not a zero sum game. Meaning, so the government, if they, if they behave properly, oh, by the way, here, there's a big assumption, as I mentioned before. So here, when we say fiscal policy, when we say expansion of fiscal policy, or in general, when we, when we talk about government action here, we assume government are responsible. We assume they are not wasting your money. Okay, but in reality, do you think that's true? No, right? So in reality, it's not. That's not the case. Here we start with a simple one, right? But in the future, if you go to a more advanced class, so you're going to study what we call the political economy, meaning like here. So you have fiscal policy, right? So the government decides to stimulate the economy, or the government decides to cool down the economy. Where the, where the decision coming from? So here, everything we assume, so there's someone is in charge of everything. So someone is cares about you, cares about everyone. But in reality, it's not, it's not the case. In reality, so like in the United States, you have two party, Republican and a Democrat, right? So they have, they go, they have a mid, midterm election, they have a general election, right? So they have different objectives from you. Right, so at the end, so what kind of physical policy is going to implement it? It's going to be a political process, meaning there's a bargain or there's a race or competition between two parties, or in Congress, so there's like a competition or a race between different congressmen and congresswomen. All right, does that make sense? But here, so we are not going that far. Okay, for the, for the moment. Which is assumed so there's a government responsible, is on top of everything, in charge of everything. So you don't need some political or party issue so they can decide what they're going to do. So that's what we have now. So in that scenario, so the first two is going to suffer from a mistake, okay, not necessarily like a terrible mistake, just like a uh, small one. In a sense, so if the government steps in, so actually, so you're gonna make the total size of the economies bigger, meaning you have more resource, meaning you have more money or more financial assets allows you to borrow. Now this is the first two. Now the third one, government budget deficit reduce private spending. So that is the famous recording equivalent, Right, so the story as follows. If the government wants to stimulate the economy, usually by reducing tax, how they can do that without, without reducing the government spending? So they must borrow, right? But now the issue is if the government borrow today or borrow more today, then eventually the government must pay off your debt, pay off their debt, right? So because for the moment, we don't, we don't allow the government to run a Ponzi scheme. Does everyone understand what does the Ponzi scheme means? So the Ponzi scheme is of, as follows. So today I borrow one dollar from you, and then you need one dollar to buy stuff. And tomorrow, so I supposed to pay you one dollar and ten cents, or next year, okay? Instead of pay you, so I borrow from the second student, one point one dollars. Now the third year or third day. So I supposed to pay the second student $1.21, assume 10% interest rate. I'm not going to pay her or I borrow from the fourth student, so on and so forth. What that means to me is I had net $1 at the beginning. I never pay off my debt. So this could pound the skin. All right. But here, so we don't allow the government to round pound the skin. If that's the case, if the government borrow more 
to finance tax cut today. What that means in the future? The future government must to raise tax. If the future government raise tax to pay off the debt today so that it can finance tax cut today. But what that means for the household? Then household households essentially just facing a, a reshuffle of their tax burden. Lower tax today, higher tax future. In the net term, nothing changed. So that's Ricardo's insight. But then what's missing from this insight, there are at least two things. Number one, if the government borrowed today to finance tax cut, and then they managed to, to pay off the debt in a center, does it matter to you? You don't care, right? You don't care, because like 100 years later, even your grandchildren probably already pay perish. You don't care, this is number one. Number two, okay, even though you care, I mean, theoretically care, but in practice, you may not have the mentality to really calculate those, even though you can calculate those, it's not necessary you can put in action. Right, just think about in reality, so how many Americans save enough for retirement? Right? So even though everyone understands it's important to save for retirement, but how many of us has, has the discipline? I understand some may don't have income, but even though you have, you have the income, how many you can resist the temptation to consume today so that you save enough for future? Does it make sense? Meaning, okay, so even those of the, uh, the, the households understand I'm going to pay higher tax in the future. They may be tempted by the current extra income to spend. Does it make sense? Okay, so those are two things has been largely overlooked by the third critique, right? <clears throat> so those, those things we already have gone through, right? All right, so now I'm going to give you a cautionary note regarding to physical policy. Physical policy, actually, this is the major difference compared with monetary policy. Usually, there's a significant lag. What that means, it just means, so you have physical policy. It's going to take a while to take effect. You can think about like, so if you ever go to the ocean, okay, if you ever ride a boat, okay, but a boat will take a turn or to stop. It's much, much difficult than like driving a car. Even a car, so for example, if you ever have the experience of driving, say, for example, U-Haul, it's much more difficult to, uh, to control compared to like small car. And then that's kind of what the way to understand what do we mean there's a lag. Okay. To, be to be precise, there are the following reasons why usually there's a lag in terms of the physical policy of fake real economy. Number one, it's gonna take time to realize where we are in terms of state of the economy, right? So in the United States, there's one, one institute usually is responsible to announce whether we are in a recession or not. This is called the National Bureau of Economic Research, NEB, MB, sorry. Yes, MBER. Okay. But oftentimes, let's take them more than a year to announce or to decide or to find out we are in a recession. And oftentimes, when they officially announce we are in a recession, the recession is already long gone. Why so complex? That's coming from the first module we have discussed, right? Because the economy is so complex. You need to collect so many data, you need to analyze. And then so you compare with uh, past data so that you decide or you find out we are in a recession. All right, this is number one. Number two, even though the first items, I mean, the first challenge you can resolve quickly. So, for example, right now you have many micro level data. So, for example, people just look at Google data, like look at traffic. Look at a satellite image, all right? And then they can kind of sense we are in a recession, 
but still take time to develop plan, right? So you need to have some expert, some economists from the Federal Reserve Bank or from the Congress. They have they hire lots of economists, right? So they are going to come up with a plan. So how we are going to help the economy? There's going to be some debate, right? So now go to the third part, even though the first and the second one, you can quickly done, but then, so the third, oh, by the way, so in the second part, so develop plan. And then, so in the, in the US, the, the political system is as follows. You have a plan, you present the president, right? The president is going to make a deliberation and decide. And then as the president, so usually they need to present the plan to the Congress, is that right? Okay, and then the Congress need to vote. Right, and then the ones conquer the vote, and then plan uh, it's going to deliver. Now, even we are in that stage, now the last one implementation of the action is going to take time. What that means? Twenty twenty. So the government decided to rescue the economy. So the stimulus plan was massive, over two trillion dollars. Part of the plan is to send every household or every American, legal American citizens some money to, to spend. But this is going to take time, right? So even, yes, modern days, we have this electronic system. It's fairly easy. But still, it's going to take at least one or two months. I don't know how much time they actually, it actually took, but in my guess, it probably take like at least two months so that the money goes to every individual. Yes. Uh, and in the 2021 taxes, they had a section for if you were supposed to get money but never did. And like six or seven of my family members had never did, right? right? Okay. Yeah. But my feeling is usually so they are pretty pretty quick in terms of ask you to pay your tax due. But then so they are slow in terms of pay what you own. But certainly there's a reason because they save tax, save interest rate. Right. Okay. So we don't have time to discuss to go to that details. But you can you can imagine, right? So it's going to take some time to really the fiscal policy, any any stim stimulus, go to the the how to say go to the bottom of the or the rabbit hole, whatever you call, it, right? That finally, so the other way to think about it is so if you have some medical emergency, you go to the hospital, right? So the doctor needs to run some diagnosis, and then so they decide. So what are I going to give to you? Even though they give you the best medicine, so the medicine is going to take a while to really have some effect. Does that make sense? I would like you to give my, use, use my son as an example. Right? So, so recently he starts some, some allergic to for something. And then, so he's like a teenager, he never understood. So the medicine is going to take some time to, to, uh, to take effect. And then, so he always are complaining, okay, so why I still feel itchy, so you give me the medicine. And then, so we need to explain to him that you need, you need to take at least one or two hours. The same thing has happened here, right? So the economy, so yes, the president signed the, uh, the bill and then sent out the money, but unemployment rate is not going to immediately drop. It's gonna take a while. The same story, all right? Now let's look at these practice questions. Contractionary physical policy. A is most helpful for restoring the economy to the potential upward level when there's a recessionary gap. That's opposite, right? B, shift the aggregate demand to the right. No, it's going to shift to the left, right? So it's going to reduce. C, often cause inflation. No, actually, it's going to push that aggregate demand, it's going to reduce the price level. And the D, shift AD to the left, resulting in reduction output and aggregate price level to fall. So that's that's correct, right? So usually, so we need a contraction, contraction or a fiscal policy when economy is in an overheat mode, like right now. But certainly, so what the government did usually for the current current events or for right now. The government was relying relies on monitor policy. Right. 
Okay, so here, so maybe I want to take a, a quick detour to help you understand the complexity of economic policy. So everyone know we are in the, entering the next general election, right? Like last year was a midterm, right? Okay, just think about, just put yourself in the shoes of the president. Even though you know we are in a inflation gap, just think about yourself, okay? So if you are the president, are you willing to take some contraction or physical policy to slow down the economy? Just pretend yourself you are the president. Now the election is coming up. Even though we are in an inflationary gap, meaning so we have very low unemployment, meaning so we have high inflation. That's exactly what was happening. Okay? Now, but however, so now you have midterm, and then so you have a general election. And now from the poll, your, your uh, approval rate is falling like a rock. What are you going to do? Are you going to implement some contraction of physical policy to cool down the economy so that the economy is maintain long-term sustainability, or you're going to keep stimulating the economy to maintain low unemployment rate? What are you going to do? If you are the president, it's a simple question. It's a simple answer, no? What, do you, what would you do if you are the president? I, I, I doubt so. I mean, the, at the city president or someone's running for president is probably doesn't care about that. I, so do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Do you agree with what I said or? Certainly not everyone agree, but I would say majority probably is going to agree what I said, right? So that's what happened. You have different opinion. I think that purely selfish people can make more money in the private sector. So most politicians on some level okay. have to do some. I agree. I agree. So I totally agree with you. That's why I was very careful about what I'm saying. I say not everyone agree with what I would just say, but if you just think about like so the entire population, the majority may think, or as the president itself, or to be precise, the politician, they probably is gonna care more about their chance of winning. Or put it another way, right? So if they if if the president or second time you are the president, yes, I understand. So you have your political ambitions, you care about your legacy, you care about long-term uh, prospect of American economy, right? But then so you have a second thought. What happened if I lost election? <laughs> Nothing is going to matter to me. Does it make sense? I even though I have a long-term plan, so I don't have the power anymore. All right? And then so my instinct or the first thing I should do is survival. That also give, give the incentive to care about short-term in terms of long-term. This is, in general, this is true. This is in general true, right? Not like, like you say, okay, so they have, so the people choose to be a politician, they may have different preference than what I was thinking, okay? But generally that's true. And you have to win before you can do anything. Right? So you have to win. So that's, uh, that's the first sense. Uh, and anyway, so those discussion kind of go way go beyond to our current, uh, current class, but I hope you, I, you, have, uh, you have a bigger picture regarding to this economic policy, All right? For now, we live in a kind of living a perfect world. In the sense, there's only one person in charge of everything. And this one person, so like probably just borrow your words, is perfectly, uh, it's <laughs> like, so what's the right word? So just, so, so in, in, in economic theory, usually we say like, a, be benevolent, meaning that it cares about uh, everyone in the economy, like perfect, but this is not the case. All right, so let's go to the next one, which of the following is true.
So essentially, this is regarding to expansionary and physical expansionary contraction, right? So the answer is C. So I'll leave that for you to read. Next one, let's just show some case study before we move to multiplier. 2009, what happened? Why there was a big stimulus play? What happened in 2009? Or to, to, to be present to the Great Recession. Great Recession, right? So there was a housing market collapse. Okay. Oh, by the way, pay attention to the timing. So the, the crisis started in 2008. And then this plan was started in 2009, almost a year, right? And so this is size. May just make a just make notes. Okay, so this is a, this is a size. It's, is less than one trillion. But at that point, it reached, it was the highest level you can imagine in history, okay? Now let's look at another one. So this is 2020. That's not the only one, this is the first one, right? Here's X, okay? Look at the size, it's 2.3 trillion. Again, let's go to the previous one. So this one is about, 700 billion. Even you consider the inflation cost of living, this one still is, is in a much larger scale. And also this one is much, I mean, in terms of uh, the speed, in terms of the, uh, the action, it's much, much quicker. Why? Certainly we have learned a lot from, from previous recession. So that's why it was so massive and it moves so fast, right? So two more things I want to emphasize. Number one, see, so where these 2.3 million goes, on the very top, household 600 billion. That just means on average, each of us sitting in this room, we collect, how much we collect on average? $150 roughly, no, sorry, $200, $200, $200. okay? So this $600, so it just goes as a cash payment to each of us. And then small business, 600 billion, right? Like civic examples, in Omaha, I knew, personally, I knew, I have a friend who like a business owner. And then, so they just take an advantage or they'll qualify for these care acts and then they borrow a loan and then renovate their business. Or I know also there are other people. So just take a loan and then just put it in the bank. But actually, so this part, this, that's my second point I was trying to explain to you. So this small business loan plus these households, the cash is partially responsible to the recent collapse of SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank, right? Okay, so the reason why I mentioned that is, uh, is because sometimes it's very difficult to strike right balance between, between stimulated economy and you may just put, you may have put too much fuel in the economy, meaning so you're going to create some trouble down the road. In some sense, right now, so we did create some eggs or fuel, or we add too much fuel and create a potential trouble to our economy. So in other words, what we have saw, like high inflation was partially caused by this stimulus plan. But again, but again, exactly, you don't have a perfect answer. Does it make sense? Okay, so before you actually implement this plan, you don't have, number one, the time was very tight, like time frame very tight, right? Number two, you don't have enough data. And then number three, even though you have enough data for the current events, but you may not have enough historical data to understand how things are going to, how things are going to respond. Because this is, this is different. It's never happened. It's not clear. 
Okay. All right, so now let's look at multiplier. So this is probably the third time we talk about multiplier. This is not the last time. We are going to look at multiplier and next, next to us. Multiplier. So the basic idea is a multiplier is like a domino. Again, okay, so the domino this sounds negative, but essentially it's like, a, I would say like a chain rule, right? So I spend $1. This $1 becomes somebody else's income. Somebody else is going to spend. And then, so keep, uh, keep going. Now, the same story for the government. The government spent $1. And then this $1 becomes somebody else's income. And they keep going. All right, so this multiplier. But now, here, the sort of part is the following. Government. What the government can do in terms of physical policy, can anyone tell me? So that's, we already discussed. So be, be, besides spend money, what else the government can do in order to stimulate the economy? Huh? What else? Lower taxes. Right, lower taxes, and maybe just go back, right? Meaning, okay, so yes, they can spend, like some of part is like direct, the government directly spend, health care provider, right? Like FEMA, that's this direct explain, uh, directly spent. State and uh, municipality, uh, new, uh, states and a uh, municipal level, right? So they 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 just direct spend, right? But on, on the other hand, so they can call your tax, give you transfer, like on the top, right? Now I'm going to explain to you. So depending on how the government is going to respond, either spending directly or call your tax or give your transfer is going to have different impact. Before I show you the answer, which one do you think has bigger impact? There are two options for the government. There are two options for the government, okay? Number one, government spend, like so let me give you a number, spend $1 billion directly. Number two, government call your tax or equivalently send you a check, collectively $1 billion. Before I show you the answer, tell me which one do you think have a large impact on the economy? Is the question clear? Is the question clear? So the government has two options, right? So you have to see in the economy. Spend directly or give you the money, let you spend it, roughly, right? So which one has larger impact? Before I show you the answer. Okay, don't worry. Okay, before I show you, so now first, this is something you already knew, right? So this is multiplier, one over one minus MPC. Okay, because one dollar spend becomes one dollar income somebody else. And this one dollar someone else who receive one dollar is gonna spend MPC. So then th these things keep moving. All right, so this is multiplier. I mean, it's the, to the net effect. Now, for the government, like I just said, usually, so they have two ways. Either they give you tax call or they just spend money directly. Okay, the short answer is the impact of government spend directly on our economy is going to be larger. That's the short answer. The long answer is as follows. So we can break down how things are going to move. Okay. If you look at this table, the first row of this table already give you the answer. This is the first row. I mean, I mean, I'm talking about here. Let me highlight. Okay. So the first row already give you the answer. Okay. Now, if you look at this column, what is this column? The government directly spent fifty billion. Just in mind, they use fifty billion to. What's the third plan? Maybe just, maybe just say for example, so they just build a new airport in Omaha, 
right? Saving them. And then so immediately the GDP is going to increase by 50 billion. Does that make sense? But now, on the other hand, if the government gives you $50 billion to spend through tax card or through transfer, and then immediately how much you're going to spend is for sure less than $50 billion. Why? Usually you save, right? And then so in this hypothetical case, you spend half, and then so immediately you can see the difference. But after that, the same. The difference actually lies in the first, first stage. But the difference is going to have impact throughout. So to be precise, to be precise, this is government spent directly. And this is you spend. Okay, the government led you to initiate. Let, let you to initiate the spending, right? So now you can see, so the net impact is different. All right, so here, just to summarize, change in government purchase has a more powerful effect on the economy than equal size change in tax or transfer. But here, but here, so this statement, this statement has some caveats. Okay, there, at least there are three caveats, meaning so they, they miss three important things. Number one, so the two are something I already explained. Number one, so this did not account for the case the government may not spend the money wisely. You agree, right? Okay. Number two, this doesn't take into account the impact on, so for example, government debt or future tax rights. Okay. Even though so we just criticized that recording equivalence, but doesn't mean recording equivalence is useless. Okay. Still, there's issue there. Okay. Those are two things we did not factor in. Now, the third thing is this statement did not consider is that, is that, now be careful, right? Or uh, just pay attention. If government purchase, do you think that's going to cover everybody in the society or most likely it's gonna benefit some? It's going to some, right? It's not even spread. Now, on the other hand, if the government give transfer a tax card, it probably is going to more targeted. Does that make sense? It's most likely it's like a lower income or who need money the most is going to receive. But for a government directly purchase spending, in the many cases, probably is going to benefit certain group. Like same enough, if, if, if the if the government decide to build a, a international airport, it's probably like a low income is not going to benefit directly. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the third thing. Third thing. Um, this government purchase may not necessarily be better than a change in tax or transfer. Now, if you think one step further, that can potentially explain why Republican versus Democrats, they prefer different fiscal instrument. Do you get the point? Because remember earlier, so I showed you the picture, right? So Trump, he may prefer tax call, right? And then, so usually if you look at the data, and then actually, so usually they contact tax for the high income. On the other hand, Democrats usually the increase transfer. The usual transfer is to lower income. Does it make sense? So you can see, so they have different political preference. They end up with differences. Again, so those things kind of go way beyond our class. 
but I think it's important for you to understand because for now we have the we have the basic knowledge to understand those more complex social economic issue. Are you are you with me? All right. Right, so here, so this is regarding to the second point. Let's summarize, I mentioned three things. Number one, the government may not be benevolent as we assume, or may not as small as we assume. Number two, so the spending is going to have impact on current and future tax. Number three, so transfer may cover different population than the direct government spending. So now here, so this is regarding to the second one, it's going to have impact on tax. But the moment we just assume like a lump sum tax, but in reality it's not. Reality of income, income tax usually is proportional to your income, right? So the difference is that, so the lump sum tax usually is not going to distort your margin. You work one hour more or less, you're going to face the same tax. But in reality, tax is proportional. The more you work, usually the more you pay in term tax. Hence, your incentive is going to differ. Does it make sense? Okay. So for the just keep this in mind, right? So the analysis we have so far is is oversimplified, but it catches the key, the basic idea. All right. So now I'm going to show you the second way. To classify physical policy. Last class, I explained to you, you can classify physical policy by expansionary versus contractionary. Now in these slides, so in reality, you're gonna see the other dimension. It's called automatic stabilizer versus discretionary physical policy. Okay. What is the difference? So automatic stabilizer essentially is something is going to automatically kick in. Some physical policy is going to automatically kick in. You don't need any additional legislation. It's already there. It's going to apply whenever the economy is in certain states. Example, unemployment insurance. Okay. So the unemployment insurance is already there, right? So as long as you classify as unemployment, and then so you're going to get this entitlement. You're going to get this insurance benefit. Now, why this is going to this is called a stabilizer, and why this? So we understand why is what is automatic. Because like whenever you're unemployed, you're going to qualify. But how is this going to stabilize our economy? And then, so here you need to, I need to remind you when unemployment is high during recession, right? Now, when, rece when recession hits, unemployment is high. So, what does that mean? The claim to unemployment insurance is it going to increase or decrease? It's going to go up, right? Because there are more people qualified, because there are more people lost their job. And then, so if there are more people qualify in recession, they qualify for unemployment insurance. Meaning, take the meaning the government is give out hand out more money to households, right? So that works as the expansion of fiscal policy. So that's going to stabilize stabilize the economy so that the economy for Border, right? Does that make sense? So this compared with 1930. Back then, so this is not well established. And then the people line up for free food, line up for help from charity. Right? But now here, so this is different. So the government automatically give you the help whenever you need. And then to prevent you to fall further. So this is automatic and stabilize the economy. On the other hand, when the economy is in the expansion, less people are employed, less people qualify, and then the less transfer to you. 
then it's kind of work as a contraction or physical product, but it's everything automatic. It's like autopilot. Is that clear? Okay. In contracts, we have discretionary physical policy. So essentially, so this is some physical policy requires special legislation, like uh, Obama stimulus plan, like a recent CARES Act, or like last year, this year's uh, IRA, which stands for Inflation Reduction Act. Right, so those are discretionary. One time, right, need, need special legislation. But the unemployment insurance is kind of written in our law or a constitution, constitution. I don't know details, but kind of, right? So you are entitled whenever you are employed. The president doesn't need any special legislation. However, here I need, I need to, I need to emphasize. 2009, under Obama administration, okay? So they extend the unemployment insurance benefit from a bit from four weeks to 52 weeks or something like that. Okay, so that there, there was a video I was thinking about, right? Now for that particular unemployment insurance benefit extension, that is discretionary. Is it clear? So it just temporarily extend unemployment insurance benefit to up to one year. So that part, the extension part is discretion. But after that legislation expired, and then you still have the regular unemployment insurance. Is it clear? All right. Now let's look at this one. Holding everything else constant, the multiplier effect for tax or transfer. It's going to be smaller. As here, so the autonomous aggregate spending is similar to government, is similar to G, right? Okay, so now let's look at another case study before we move to government debt issue, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's class. We look at the data from 2009 to 2013. So each dot represent one country. For each, each country, so we have two variables or two observations. Let's use United States as example, is here. And what this dot means is that during this period, So U.S. the budget balance. Let me see. Yeah. So the budget balance is here. I see. Right. So it's it's six percent. Now on the vertical line is percentage change in GDP. Right. So this is for US. So the budget balance essentially is the tax revenue minus your spending. Right. So that means if you go to this direction, meaning you have a deficit, meaning if you go this direction, meaning there are two terms, right? One is spending, the other is tax. If you go to the left hand side, what this means? This means you are going to spend more, you're likely to spend more, you're likely to tax less. 
Does it make sense? If you go to left hand side. Because left hand side, you have a positive balance goes to negative. Okay, negative means you spend more than you than your income. All right? Okay. Now vertical line is percentage change in GDP. And it certainly is positive means you are you are getting out of the wood, right? So you are recovering. If a negative means you're still in recession, right? So now we have these countries, about like 15 countries for this time period. Each country is represented by one dot. Each dot is a combination of their physical policy and the GDP, the performance of GDP in this time period. Now, based on this dot, so we can see there is a strong correlation. So this correlation suggests the more deficit you have, the higher growth, or more likely you will get out of the recession. Is it clear? Okay. So then, so there are two things. I mean, two messages from this. I mean, one is a message, the other is a question. Message number one, expansionary fiscal policy indeed work in the time period of 2009 to 2013, right? Okay, but now the second one modulates like a question. Okay. If expansionary physical policy work, now why you have this country, let me highlight those. Okay, why you have those country, they're not using this knowledge. Right, so actually, wait, wait a second. Oh no, there's one more, one more here. Okay, this, this five country, if you, if you read the history or read the news, sometimes we call them Have you heard about that? Short for peaks. Never heard? P-I-I-G, P stands for Portuguese. I, there are two I, Italy and Ireland. And then, so Greece and Spain. This peaks country. Okay, it's almost similar to P-I-G. Kind of indirectly says, so they probably have some something messed up in terms of their government policy. Now, anyway, so my question for you is, now we are in the principal class, right? So up to this point, everyone understand, if there's a deep recession, what we should do? Stimulus income, right? This is something even the college students, you already knew. But why those peaks country, they did not follow that simple advice. That is the question. Okay, the short answer is, it's not they do not follow. It's just because their hand is tied. They don't have the capacity to increase G to decrease T. I know why. So now let's go to the next topic. It's regarding to debt. Okay, let me just go back and then so we need to have the, so we need to fully expect because this is a little bit subtle. So again, the question here is, so why there are countries? They know expansionary fiscal policy is a good option, but why they cannot do that? Instead, actually they, what they did is called austerity. What does austerity means? Essentially, it is from the point of view of the government. They tighten their bill. They reduce their spending, increase their tax. 
But we already knew, I mean, since 1930, we already knew this is a terrible idea, right? But why in 2010, they still, they are still doing something terrible. The short answer is they are, they are constrained. They don't have the capacity to do what this textbook prescribes. And what is binding them is because those countries in the past, they were not responsible. They have a lot of debt. But then, so there are further two more questions. Question number one, how come they accumulate so much debt? Question number two, why high debt is going to tie their hands when they need expansionary fiscal policy the most? If this is clear, now we have lots of information. Okay, where we start is expansion or fiscal policy. We understand that, right? So why expansion or fiscal policy is good? Are you with me? Okay, but now here, so the complexity is, everyone knew it is good. Why these peaks country, they fail to take that advice. Now my answer to you is that they, their hand will tie. I mean, it's the government. Government do not have much room to increase G and then decrease T. And why? It's because they have a lot of debt. Okay, and a lot of debt they have accumulated in the past. Squeeze their room. This is going to show up in the following slides, right? But then, so from their story, this is kind of give up lessons in terms of projection what's going to happen for Americans fiscal problem in the future. Are you with me? Are we good? Okay. So now you remember this dead car, right? So there are a bunch of questions from this day club. What brought, brought us with, what brought us here? So this, this is what I have like probably a year ago, right? So it was like 29 trillion. And then today's, at the beginning of today's class, I show you right now it's close to 32 trillion, right? It's, it's growing, it is growing. But the first question is, what brought us so much debt? Okay, but the short answer is, it has to do with the budget balance, means the surplus and the deficit. Okay, the first one. The second question, the second question. So what is gonna be the long-term impact of this huge debt? All right, and then the short answer is kind of here in peaks. The second question. Now the third question, as I'm going to show you, deficit leads to debt. And then the question is: a deficit always good or always bad? All right. So that's the third question. And then so we have many more questions. Right, but here the central theme is to understand the debt and the relationship between debt and the government deficit. All right, but before I move further, let me ask you a relative simple, not necessarily a simple question. Do you think a deficit is always a bad thing? You, okay, so why is that a bad thing? Why you need a deficit? You need expansion. Whenever you need increased spend or whenever you need expansion or physical policy. Just think about individuals, right? So for you right now in your lifetime, it's a better idea to borrow instead of save. Do you understand that? So for now, it's probably better for you to take some loan to go to college instead of say, for example, work in McDonald's, safe, and then trying to buy a car. Does that make sense? 
is similar to the government, but certainly, certainly there's some difference, right? For the government, I guess the main difference is the government compared to households, compared to individual. Governments on the surface, they live forever. Not for us. Are you with me? All right. So yes, short answer, deficit is not always a bad sense. So for example, when there's a recession, and this graph shows, right, some deficit help you. But certainly the deficit is going to translate into debt. Okay? If you keep accumulating until you reach a certain point, you are entering this territory. You become speaks. So there's a subtle, there's a subtle, there's a fine line you need to walk. But certainly this leads to the discussion in the US currently like regarding to debt ceiling. All right, so let's go slowly. Okay. To summarize, before we move further, I want to emphasize three things. Number one, expansion of fiscal policy is necessary when we are in a recession. This is number one. Number two, this expansion of fiscal policy come with a cost. What's the cost? Debt, right? So this comes up in the next slide. And then number three, number three, so debt is good and bad. It's good in the sense it's help you, but in the bad, in the sense it's going to force you to accumulate debt. But then, so the debt, you have certain threshold. Once you reach, once you pass, and then there's no way to return. All right, so, but certainly that explains why there's a discussion in the US about the debt ceiling, right? Just to give you a quick, uh, quick uh, history. So the debt ceiling was first introduced in 1917. And before 1917, so the US government, if, if they want to borrow, do you know how they to do that? How they achieve that? Yes. Well, they write a law. They write a law. Or, so yeah, super precise, before 1917, for each borrowing, the government want to, want to implement, they need to have a special legislation, right? And then so after 1917, they streamline, the so set a debt limit. As long as you don't, as long as you below this debt ceiling, you are free to borrow. And to help you understand, this is like saving them in your household. So like use my household as an example, right? So my son is a teenager. Whenever he wants to buy some stuff, essentially he needs to ask us. And then so we give him money, right? Now, so once he becomes saving them in college or he eventually find a job, and then so he has a budget, which is like his credit card or whatever. As long as his spend is below that threshold, he's fine. Similar story. Right. Okay. So let me go to these slides to understand the relationship between government budget and the debt. Start with government saving. Is a standard of saving equal to T minus G minus TR. What's TR is transfer. Okay. So the G and the TR is the total government spending. Okay. Right. So whenever tax revenue is more than the government spend, and then so you are in the surplus. On the other hand, you are in a deficit. So depending on what kind of physical policy you carry, it's going to have different impact on your budget. And so if you have an expansionary physical policy, and usually, usually you're going to become more deficit. On the other hand, if you have a contraction or physical policy, and usually you're going to have more surplus, 
right? And this is the U.S. budget deficit look like uh, since 1964. If it's a positive here, because this deficit is a positive, meaning it's deficit, meaning so you spend more than your tax income. Now, if it's negative, means what? Means you have a surplus. Now look at U.S. history since 1964, okay? So only during Clinton administration, they managed to have surplus. Most of the times we are running deficit, but that certainly this explain or this contribute to the ever growing government debt. The other things I want, I want you to pay attention to is that the deficit you should increase under the shaded area. But what are those shaded area represent? It's, it's really on the slide, right? It's recession. But why during recession, the government deficit increase? Up to now, can you explain to me why? I'm sorry, expansion of fiscal policy, very good. But there's another reason. To understand that, let's go back to the slides. Expansion of fiscal policy means when there's a recession, they cut tax, they increase G, increase transfer. So in a certain way, make this S go to more negative. Right, so that's what we have learned so far. But there's another reason why in recession a more likely round deficit. GDP goes down. Exactly. T essentially is relies on GDP, right? So what is GDP? GDP essentially is, is income. And T is gonna be part of the income. Sorry, T is gonna rely on income. So during recession, the total income collapse and then the total, if nothing else change, you have less to collect, right? So that is explain why these things go up during recession and they go down during expansion. Now that explains why during Clinton administration, so the deficit falls. 